pray. Amen. Well, let's turn our Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, and we'll read again uh, verses um, <clears throat> five, through, uh, 5 through 9. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, um, loving what is, uh, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Last week we uh, did a like a summary overview before looking at that one particular phrase, um, uh, not fond of sordid gain, because for many weeks we've been going at this at a snail's pace, uh, looking at the particular details of the qualification for an elder. Well, uh, It's good once in a while to kind of step back and see the big picture, that this book of Titus, in three chapters, uh, it's so concentrated. It's like those little kitty toys where... It's like a pill, and you put in it water, and it starts what? Expanding. Have you ever seen those? Um, and it's amazing. It's so small, but it expands into this dinosaur. Then your kids, you know, play around with it. That's what Titus is like. It's like this compacted pill of doctrine that expands into multitudes of application for the church. And it basically boils down in its most essential form what the church ought to look like. The church is to be concerned with leadership. The church is to be concerned with proper biblical behavior. And the ultimate goal of the church for both leadership and the people is to exhibit Christ to the world, to adorn the doctrine of God in every respect, so that they might believe also. Meaning, the mission of the church is evangelical. We are here to evangelize. We are here to proclaim Christ, but to do that, we must live out the gospel. We must live distinctively Christian. When a, when a person says, I believe, but does not live the gospel out, it is the worst possible testimony. No one will come to Christ through that. Hypocrites mar the image of the church. But if you look at chapter 2, Verse 10, it says, Not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deeds, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Meaning, the reason why Jesus Christ came was to save us. Verse 10 and verse 11, the grace of God, that's a reference to Christ. He is the grace of God the Father who appeared, bringing salvation to all men. So what is Titus about? It's about telling the church, get your behavior straightened out. Exhibit with your life and your character and your actions godliness so that when people see your actions, they will want to turn and believe in Jesus Christ. It begins with leadership and then it trickles down to the people in the church. So Titus is worth the time. It's an amazing book to go through uh, for people. Now, we, we want to get into chapter 2 where it talks about the behavior of the people. Right now, we're stuck on the, um, the characteristic of pastors.
But as we said before, pastors are not super Christians. Okay? Pastors are not some one or two levels above normal people, Christianity. Pastors are simply obedient people to the scriptures. Meaning, a pastor is supposed to live the same way as anyone else is called to, but he's placed in that position because he's been tested and approved as one who does live like a normal Christian. So when we look at the qualifications of the pastor, first of all, notice that there's no qualification about what he does. Like, does he preach well? Does he, does he look like this? Or does he wear this garb? It refers to his character. And in that sense, everyone should try to attain to these qualifications. It doesn't mean that you're going to become a pastor. It means you're simply living obedience to Christ. When you, are, when you are obedient to God's word, you will be a husband of one wife or a wife to one husband. You will, be, you will lead your children. Uh, you will not be, um, you will be above reproach. You're not going to be quick-tempered. You're not going to be enraged or you will not be um, uh, angry at people. You're not addicted to wine. You are not pugnacious. You're not fond of money. You are hospitable. You love what is good, sensible, just, devout. All of these qualifications is just for normal Christianity. And so what the Bible is saying is you want to put, as a leader in the church, a normal Christian. Just a normal, behaving believer. Now, obviously, we are not the ones to pick the normal believer and say, you should be a pastor, the Holy Spirit calls particular men to fill that position. Now, <clears throat> just briefly to review once more, I want to stress that elders are pastors and pastors are elders. There's no distinction here. Okay, In fact, one man carries four titles. The leader of the church is, a, I guess five, leader, okay, pastor, teacher, overseer, elder. Okay, so five, what was that, five or six? Let's see, pastor, teacher, elder, overseer, leader. Okay, five. These are all different titles of one man, meaning there's no like, oh, he's a pastor, but I'm an elder. No, that's, that's wrong. There, there are people today who confuse that title. They like elders. They want to be called an elder because it has like this title of nobility and dignity. They don't want to be called pastor because once you say I'm a pastor, then everyone's perspective of you changes. Oh, you are an elder. Oh, he's supposed to be respected. Oh, you're a pastor. Oh, so you're poor. That's like the first thing that they, you know, think about. For some reason or, or, or another, people in the church, elders usually are the richest guys in the church, and the pastor is like the poorest one, and they're all leaders of the church. That, you know, that's not supposed to work like that, okay? An elder is a pastor. A pastor is a what? An elder. He's a leader, pastor, shepherd, teacher, all of those administrator of, of the church. Uh, again, you will find uh, in, in the modern day church um, a pastor called a pastor and a man called an elder. And, it, and it's because he doesn't want to be a full-time shepherd teacher. He wants to be a leader of the church but not study the scripture. And that normally happens. Look, in this ministry, if you are an elder, okay, if you are an elder, you must teach weekly. Okay? Maybe not in the main pulpit, okay? But you have to teach a small group. You must be someone who, ca who cannot stop teaching. You're apt to teach. Whether you're given a position or not, you're going to find someone to teach every single week because a pastor always wants to disciple people. While everyone is supposed to disciple one another in a general sense, a shepherd cares for his flock. And so when you have a man 
who wants to care for people by leading them in the scripture, even though they're not given a position in the pulpit, you'll find them constantly wanting to meet with people to teach young men and young women the scriptures. When you find the man who wants to be an elder, but he doesn't want to teach, he waits for someone to give him that spot, right? Oh, you're going to be teaching two months from now, and then he, he waits for that day, he's not called to be an elder. He's not. No matter how good his message is, he, he wants to teach, but he doesn't want to shepherd. And see, that's why we have to be careful about these titles. You have to remember, a man called of God is all of those things at once. A leader, shepherd, instructor, administrator. Uh, I keep missing one. What did I miss? Leader, shepherd, So tired from the lack of sleep, I can't think anymore. Okay, all of those five that I mentioned, just rewind the tape. Okay, and you can listen to it again. What I'm saying is, you can't pick and choose which one you want. Oh, I'm an elder. Okay, what does that mean? You just want people to look up to you, <laughs> right? Okay, if you want to serve the church, be a deacon. Be a deacon. You can serve the church all you want, but if you want to instruct and disciple and teach, okay, you are called to be. An elder. So young guys, young men, if you want to be a future elder, you need to be constantly teaching. That means you will be constantly studying. Because you want to give some people, uh, you want to give what you've learned to people that you meet, to people in the church. So I want to encourage you youngsters who want to become pastors in the future or elders or overseer, start studying the scripture and call people and say, let's meet because I want to teach you something. Not just to go rock climbing, you know, but to teach while they're there hanging by two fingers and you teach them the scriptures. And again, in my opinion, I think people just want dignity. They want respect. But they don't want to do the grunt work of ministry. And it takes a lot to do proper pastoral ministry. Okay? So, everyone who wants to be an elder, number one, must study the scriptures, preach on a consistent basis wherever, okay? Have consistent and lengthy prayer life, must be evangelistic, know how to defend the scriptures, and know how to administrate the details of the ministry. Okay. So again, let's go back to now Titus chapter 1 and, <clears throat> and, and continue on. Now, we didn't finish the, the topic of sordid gain. Now, as I told you last week, uh, a man cannot be a pastor if he's in it for money. You know, when it says here, he shall not be fond of sordid gain, I don't think it necessarily has to do with the fact that he's so greedy for money. Uh, the idea here is that he will, he wants to be part of a religious system because it's going to make him money, whatever amount. Some might be greedy for a lot of money, and there are those false teachers who use religion for money. False religion does bring in a lot, of, a lot of money. As Jesus said last week, remember, look at that woman. She only has a few copper coins. She gave all that she had. He, he wasn't commending her for giving everything. In fact, he doesn't want poor people to give everything because they need to live. He was just comparing. That poor woman, because of this false religious system, has been convinced that if she gives all that she has, somehow she's being pleasing to God when in fact God does not receive glory from that. He receives glory when we give out of our abundance, okay, not to hoard it for ourselves, but for people who are in need, he's not going to require them to give. Why did she give? Why did that poor widow in Luke, I think, 11, give? It's because of the false religious system. And after that, Jesus says, look at all these um, um, decorations on this, on, this, um, on this temple. Look at the clothing that they wear. He's saying they're abusing the poor to get money from them and buying all these wealthy things for themselves, luxurious things for themselves. Now, the applications were various. Like today, when young men want to become 
pastors or want to enter ministry, sometimes I hear one guy tell me this, I, I failed at every job. I, I failed at literally everything in my life. And, and that means clearly the Lord wants me to be a pastor. Like, what are you saying? Like, God made you fail in school and your grades and GPA just to make it clear that the only thing you can do is the pastoral ministry? You really made us look bad. Failures should come here. That, that's just not right. I, I think whoever fills the pulpit should be a gifted person. You know, he, he's able to study. He's able to think and administrate. He has self-control. He is driven. He is, he is a man of respect and dignity. Right? He has skills, and that's why the Lord wants to use him there. So he's basically, my friend, he's basically saying, I need money, and the only place I'm going to make money is what? The church. I, I don't think he's called. I don't think anyone is called when they are in the office of the pastorate because they want to make some money. Even the little amount. Easy money, right? <clears throat> As Paul says, I will do this free of charge. I am compelled to preach. Uh, money doesn't motivate me. It, it, now, he'll make it clear that, that the church must support the pastor, but on the flip side, the pastor's heart is, you know what? I will, I will do whatever it takes so that I can stay and give you the word as long as you want to hear it from me. You know, you know Alex Montoya told our class, you should be so eager to preach you know, that you would go to the streets and rather than beg for money, you would tell them, I will pay you if you, if you will listen to me preach. You know, I will preach for free. You know? <clears throat> In fact, I'll pay you to hear me, hear me preach. What he's saying is, don't do it for money. You know, some guys will only go to a church where it's big and substantially wealthy so that he will have some amount of income. And some parents will tell their son, you know, don't apply to that small church because how are they going to support you? You know, you get, you get a guy who is money-oriented, he should not be a pastor. And by the way, um, a lot of young men f uh, will fall because of money because while they make this amount, the next pastor down the street makes twice as more and there's jealousy. Or within the same church, the elders decide to award this particular uh, teacher because he's preaching well and, as the Bible says, double his, his, his honor. And so they double his income and, and the guy's jealous. See, when, when you want to preach uh, God's word, your heart must be free from any desire for monetary compensation because God will provide. Maybe not directly through them. Whatever the case, it is enough to be able to give God's word. It's a privilege beyond imagination. It's an honor itself. Yeah, I've seen enough guys just pass a church by because that church is small and uh, I don't think they're going to support my family. Now, I don't want to blame them too much because they have a wife and three kids and and, and where is he going to find a job, you know? And so, so for some families, it's totally fine to go after a church that will support them. But I think most guys should be able to be sacrificial to serve while working full-time and waiting for the Lord to provide at the right time. If you look at verse 11, <clears throat> these false teachers, it says they must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. What that means is they're teaching just weird things because they know they'll get money for it. And it was, you, it was a custom at that time when a teacher, a traveling teacher came to town, people would gather money together and give him a stipend or some kind of a love offering to show them how, show him how appreciative they are, whatever he set up there. And Paul is saying, "Don't let that happen now. This is a, 
This is a church. Don't let any traveling teacher come. And, 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 and he's saying there were families who brought them in and listened to them, and the families gave them some amount of money so they could travel to the next stop. I think it's the worst thing when false teachers or pastors or whoever's teaching, they're not studying the scripture well to say whatever it takes to say, say something. So that means they're teaching wrong things in order to sustain a financial living through the church. Now, <clears throat> we need to talk about tithing, okay? Because if we're going to talk about uh, supporting the, the elder, uh, the full-time elder, so amongst the elder group, some will be full-time workers, bivocational. Some will be full-time supported by the church. And both in the scripture, both are, both are mentioned. Okay. Well, for them to receive income, it's not going to come from the state. It's not going to come from the government or some company. It's going to obviously come from the tithe or the offerings from the local church. And, and some of you, or just used to giving money because you've seen your parents do it. Some of you just, every time we have our offering service, uh, you just give. I don't think many of you understand what the Bible says about tithing. So this is an issue that I think we need to take some time to, to understand. Uh, last Sunday, one of the deacons from the Korean ministry, uh, <laughs> he's like, congratulations, you have four kids. Wow, you have four kids. And, and, the, and the father, the, the husband said, Pastor Chi, you need to make a lot of money. <laughs> and I said, I just didn't know how to respond to that. I said, okay. I was just smiling because I know what he meant. So what he means is it's going to cost a lot of money to raise four what? Four kids. His wife, she's like, oh, honey, pastors can't make a lot of money. We have to give more. We have to give more offering. <laughs> and it's just so awkward hearing people talk about that in front of the pastor now we have to give more offering on Sunday. And so what? What is he saying? The more, the more children I have, the more look I'm going to get, the more stares I'm going to get from the church members. Like, now we got to increase our giving. Like, that's what you want. <laughs> that, that, okay, so I'm just, that's just a funny story. That is obviously not the right perspective. I'm, I'm sure they don't really think that way. Um, but, you know, how do you give? What does the Bible say in terms of giving? First of all, Let's turn to Acts 5, and let's establish the fact that the church did receive offering, okay? Um, and it's part of service. It's, it's a worship, okay? Now, this is a story about Ananias and Sapphira. There's a comparison here, though. You start at chapter 4, verse 36, where it talks about a man named Joseph, this is actually a Levite, a Cyprian. This is Barnabas. And what happened at that time <clears throat> when the believers got saved, when Jewish people from all different regions of, the, the, of that area came to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, 3,000 became Christians. Some of them didn't want to go back home. They wanted to stay and join the church. They had no money, no association, no family. How were they going to live? And so what people did in the church was they start to share. Some who had wealthy lands, or they were wealthy because of their lands, sold their property, brought all the money to the disciples and said, I offer this to the church. Do what you have to do to help so-and-so live. So if you look at verse 32, it says, <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 32, the congregation of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Guys, this is not communism, okay? This is not distribution of wealth or socialism, okay? This is, this is love. What they did was, so-and-so needs a house or a place. I'm going to sell my land, give all the money to the leadership, and give them the authority to dispense whatever they have to, so that the 3,000 believers in this church, none of them will have a need. They will all be provided for. Because some of them, again, didn't go back home. They, they left. Their families, they, this is our new family now. This is where I belong. And so Joseph does this, verse 36, lays it at the apostles' feet, 
It says, verse 37, who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wise full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, <clears throat> Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to the and filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land while it remained unsold did it not remain your own what Peter is saying is when you sold the land it's your money you could do whatever you wanted with it you didn't have to give it to us meaning the point of this this passage is not you should have given it all it was you should have never lied about giving it what all because what was going on is Barnabas and others gave everything, meaning the whole church saw. It, it wasn't private giving. Some people will say, I don't want anyone to know what I gave. Please just keep it private. Here, during church service or some time during that gathering, Barnabas came to the front, gave the offering. So I guess we should do it that way. I will stand here every Sunday. You guys will walk down and you will pour it in. Well, you know, I'll hold the basket this time, right? <laughs> oh, that's a lot. Good, thank you. <laughs> and one of you going to come with a pink slip of your car. Wow, you know, um, Eunice gave back her car. <laughs> her Prius, right? You know, anybody want this? You know, and I'll put it in. And then, you know, can you imagine? You know, like, you know, Ricardo comes. I give my, I give my desktop computer. You know, it's a gaming computer, but I, I don't game anymore. I'm a Christian, right? You know, I, 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 do, I, I, I do computer of science, whatever. I program. I don't need this crazy, hefty computer. I give this. And I'll be like, praise the Lord. <laughs> Paul, Lim, do you want this? He's like, yes. Uh, you know, and so we give it to him. And so can you imagine a church service like that? Because that's what it looks like. Because Ananias and Sapphira realized Wow, so-and-so is getting all the attention. So let's get recognized by the church. But man, that's a lot of money. Let's keep some of it back and let's tell them this is all the money we got for selling our what? And they lied because they wanted recognition. Peter calls them out, you lie. How is it that you can lie to the Holy Spirit? And, he's t and again, it reminds them, you are not compelled to give everything. So that means the church doesn't force people to give, and God does not require you to give everything. It's a decision of personal choice. You can decide how much to give. Verse 5. At the end of verse 4, you have not lied to men, but to God. And, and as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who have heard of it. The young men got up, covered him, and after carrying him out, they buried him. And then his wife comes and lies, and then she dies. That must have been the worst, most frightening service. And I think that day, they made they brought in the most amount of money because they're like, he died and everybody brought out, <laughs> they're like, oh, I, I need to give more or we better not lie about what we have. And so everyone's just start to give more because they didn't want to die. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the fear, the holy fear of giving? And that is a part of a worship service. Guys, when we have offering service, it's supposed to be a time of great fear of God because the Holy Spirit knows what's in your bank account. He knows what you did with your money. He knows how sacrificial or how selfish you are. And as you give and people see what you give, you are basically looking like a godly person giving to the church when in fact, as you put that envelope in, there's two quarters in there. Okay? Or one dollar and a lot of fluffy tissue paper to make it look thick. <laughs> I don't think any of you ever. Can you imagine someone doing that? That's just so sad, right? <laughs> what do you give? You give. You give to the Lord. 
So offering time during the church is a very worshipful time. And so the question is now, what's the point? The point is we give to supply needs to one another. May this, I'm sure, was used, also used to support the 12, disi- the 12 disciples. None of them went back to fishing. You guys remember that? After Jesus re- resurrected, what did they do? They went back to what? Fishing. Actually, Jesus called them twice. The first time, Peter, James, and John, come follow me. It says they left their nest and followed him. And then eventually, sometime in between that, they went back. And Jesus had to show them he could provide for everything. And he called them again. And then after, when he died, what did they do? They went back to what? Fishing because they thought they had to live. They had, Peter had a wife and they had to provide for their home. But after he resurrected, he told them, I will provide for you. And now here, the church, the 3,000, by giving, they're going to support the 12 apostles and anybody in the ministry that was in need. And the giving was plenty, generous. Okay? And so right now, if there are people in need in the church, yes, we will try to support them, provide for them. And that's the first thing that we need to do as individuals If you see a need in someone's life and you can provide, you must do so. And in today's time, now it's the pastor who needs to fully devote himself to the ministry. As you give the offering, is to support him that he can continue with undivided attention to give back to the church the word of God that we so desperately need. And in that sense, yes, you should be eager to make more money. To give full support to the elder. And then with whatever's left over, give full support to the other missionaries, other uh, Christian ministries, but primarily to the people in this church. And in the future, if we have widows who are over 60 and who cannot, who, who are without family members, we must support them too financially. Okay. And then on top of that, the building, the cost of electricity, air conditioner, everything. There's expense that goes into this, so we seek to give more. Um, there was a church that uh, I think uh, Jim Ricker was giving like a seminar. He goes to different churches. Uh, he works for John MacArthur. He's an elder there at Grace. Um, and he does the taxes for pastors. And he said that a lot of these churches... They, they are so focused on other ministries that they take all the money and siphon it out to them and they give barely enough for the pastor's family to live. And he would, he would advise them, look at this, look at all of this expense, okay? First cut out anything you don't need and put majority of the income to the pastor's family and whatever's left, start partitioning it out to others because the church's primary person of interest in supporting financially is the teaching pastor, the full-time teaching pastor and his family. Now let's look at some of uh, some other passages about support. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse um, 7. Now, <clears throat> he, uh, he's sending out 70 disciples. Like in verse 1, it says, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others. So at one point, Jesus had 70 followers. And he sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, plentiful but the laborers are, laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no, um, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, what they give you for the laborer is worthy of his what 
his wages. Now, what is Jesus saying? Now, this is a particular command for 70 disciples. It's not something we should do, like we shouldn't carry around a wallet or don't talk to anybody on the road, whatnot. He's sending them directly to the villages and said, you know, just go there straight. And as you're teaching, someone is going to invite you into their house and you need to go and stay. Okay? And whatever they provide for you, that is your wage. Telling them it's okay to receive hospitality for your service. The worker is worthy of his what? Of his wage. Turn to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Here in the New Testament, Paul makes it clear that the preaching of the gospel is a occupation uh, full time, something that's that's paid. This, you you have to make a living by preaching the gospel. First Corinthians nine verse eleven. It said, "If we sold spiritual things in you, <clears throat> is it too much? If we reap material things from you." If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have to share from the altar? He's, he's quoting back from the Old Testament that when you become a priest, you will serve at the altar, and people will bring their sacrifices. They'll bring slabs of meat. You'll put it on the, on the altar and burn it. Sometimes you will boil it, and guess what? Who's going to eat the meat? The priest. Yes, that's how they lived. People would offer their sacrifice to God, but they're not going to let this meat go waste. And so God said, you can eat all the meat that's been sacrificed. It's yours. Now, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abi Abihu, these guys, they wanted the raw meat. They wanted, like, they wanted to cook it afterwards. They didn't want like sacrificed food. They wanted like real meat. So they would take the meat before it was actually like sacrificed. And that's why the Lord was so angry with them. They didn't fulfill their, their, their performance. But the point is, these priests will live off of their work. When they're doing their work, and this included the giving of food to God, God will allow them to eat some of that offering. Here Paul mentions this to say that those who serve God in that capacity must receive their, their, their salary, their wage. So look at verse 14. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the what? From the gospel. Okay. Now, some people will read that and say, see, a pastor cannot work. A pastor must not work. He must only preach the gospel and live on whatever the church can actually supply to him. But they're completely mistaken because the verse right before that, what, do, what does Paul say? We have a right to do this, but we give up that what? That right. Meaning, I'm still preaching the gospel and I'm making whatever means I have to to make ends meet. Sometimes making tents, sometimes even starving, sometimes doing this or sometimes working or whatever. He says to the Corinthian church, we did not require you to give it to us. Paul wanted to be an example to them that he's not like the other false teachers who will come into town, start up this new religious group and tell them, you need to pay me. Once the church was established though and other future pastors will come, he tells them, yes, that pastor of that church must making a living from proclaiming the gospel, you must support him. Because this church was not supporting him properly. Uh, it could have been Apollos, okay? because after Paul left, Apollos came. But basically, this is not, the Corinthian church was not the place any pastor wanted to go. It's like the worst church possible. Okay? But Paul makes it here, Notice he quotes the Lord, verse 14. The Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the what? The gospel. So as he preaches the word of God, if the church can support him, they should definitely support him full time, if possible. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17.
1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. It says, the elders who rule well are, are to be considered worthy of double honor, okay, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So he's a good administrator, okay, but especially you can see it in his preaching and teaching. He's gifted. He's well prepared. He's working diligently. And they realize for a man to do that, he has to be given time to study. He has to be given time to really focus the best of his energy on studying, not at the end of the day when after he's worked eight hours, ten hours of secular job and comes home and tries to study again. By the way, that double honor does not mean you greet him twice. You know, 안녕하세요 and 안녕하세요 again, you know. It's not like you honor him twice. The word for honor here has to do with monetary compensation. You give him double of what he has been receiving. You increase it. And Paul says in verse 18, The scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. So again, this is coming from the angle of the people to the pastor now. The pastor to the people, he's going to do it freely. He's going to do it graciously. He's going to do it with commitment and sacrifice. But to the people, he's an ox. If he's working, <clears throat> do not muzzle his mouth. Meaning, do not prevent him from eating from you. He's serving from you what he should be receiving. He's going to get discouraged. That's what he's saying. Right? Can you imagine an ox as he's treading the grain, this huge stone, as he's rolling that around? He wants to eat some of that grain, but the master muzzles his mouth. He can't eat it. It's like torturing an animal. You're near food, and you're, re you're prevented from eating. So he's telling the church <clears throat> and the other elders who are maybe not full-time, don't do that to that one elder who's working diligently. So that means amongst the elders here, some were paid, some were not, some were paid double, and some were, were paid just whatever. Because this was an instruction to Timothy, who was an elder of that what? Of that church. And maybe it was Timothy that he, Paul wanted them to support more fully. Whatever the case, this was to be read to the whole, uh, the whole church to understand. <coughs> John MacArthur says, All Christians, including pastors, have the right to make a living for themselves and for their families. Jesus said the laborer is worthy of his wages. Paul wrote to the believers in Corinth, A pastor not only has a right, uh, to earn a living, but as a right to be paid by those whom he ministers. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. The word time or honor was used of monetary value as well as esteem. And in this context, doubtless, it, doubtlessly it includes the idea of financial remuneration. Now, then if that's the case, then how should we tithe? Well, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 9. Now, I, don't, I guess the word tithing is just kind of used so much, but let's just call it giving, okay? Uh, I know in the Old Testament, um, people think that there's like a 10% thingy or, or whatnot that you have to give a percentage of your income. Uh, first of all, you guys have to understand, you give about, as you grow, you're going to be giving about 15 to 20% to the government in taxes. And on top of that 10%, that's 30% of your income. I don't think that's right. Okay, I don't think that's what the Lord, Lord is requiring. And second, uh, if you add up all the percentages in the Old Testament, it actually goes up to about 23%. So can you imagine someone thinking that you have to give 23% of your income after taxes to the church? You're, gonna, you're not going to have anything. You'll be in debt. Okay. So what is the principle of giving? It says in chapter 9, verse 6 through 7, very clearly, now I say this, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his what? Heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful what? Giver. So give as you desire. Give generously. That's what it's saying. But there's no like this much or that much. You need to give generously. So 
as, as opposed to giving stingily, okay? You know, um, you got $5, and you're like, I'm going to give 4 because I need to go eat an In-N-Out burger afterwards, okay? Actually, In-N-Out's getting pretty expensive too now. Now, if you haven't eaten for days, it's understandable, <laughs> okay? But what I'm saying is you want to learn to give generously. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 16. When should you give? Well, <clears throat> it says on the first day of the week. <coughs> first Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 3 says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. So this was Paul's instruction to the church. You must give to the poor, give to the church. We need to collect offering. And he says here, verse 2, on the first day of every week, that's referring to Sunday, each of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper. And notice the phrase, as he may prosper, meaning when God blesses you with a lot, give more. If God doesn't bless you and you're really tight, Give less. Whatever the case, give, but give in, um, in proportion to how much God provides for you. So that no collections be made when I come. So collections are to be made on the first day of the week, which is referring to Sunday. That's why we have an offering time on Sunday. Okay? But as you prosper, as you prosper. Turn back to 2 Corinthians 8. And I'm just going to give you a list of principles, and then we're going to close. We're not going to take the time to, you know, take apart the passage. We're just going to extract the general principles here of giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> it says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. That in great ordeal of affliction, <clears throat> their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. So what Paul is saying is they begged us to give, meaning we didn't want to take it from them. They begged us to take our money. I mean, take their money. Like they, they could not, they did not let Paul go without him receiving some of the offerings of the church. Verse 5. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus, as he had previously made a, made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as, as well. And then he says, and you should know this verse, but just as you abound in everything in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in love, we need to respond to you so that you abound in this gracious work. You are always abounding in the work of God. Now, there are, let's see, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, nine principles of giving in these six verses. Number one, you give by the grace of God. In verse one, he says, we, miss, we wish to make known to you by the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Giving is to be done by the grace of God. When God grants you money, it's His grace. As He gives you that grace, you provide for those who are in need in proportion. Number two, you give during suffering. I know so when some people, when they're suffering, they don't give. They just stop giving to the church. You must continually give despite your suffering. Look at verse 2. That in a great ordeal of affliction, meaning they were under great persecution, but they did not stop and say, oh man, now we're being persecuted. We should save up. They continue to what? Give. Number three, they gave with joy. Again, verse two, that in great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of what? Joy. And their deep poverty. So what Paul is saying is they were so poor and suffering and they still gave. 
They were in poverty. Now, how much they actually gave, we don't know. But in Paul's mind, they should not have given at all. And these poor saints, these Christians, barely having enough, begged Paul, take this to the brothers in Jerusalem and let them know we love them. So you give by the grace of God, you give during suffering, you give with joy, and fourthly, you give even though you are in poverty, and five, you give generously, liberally. Verse 3 and verse 2 at the end, the wealth of their liberality. Notice the opposite ends here. They're in deep poverty, but their giving was wealthy. Meaning God does not judge the wealth of your giving by the amount of your giving. It's always in proportion to what he has given to you. They had nothing, and so when they gave a little of their whatever they had, in God's eyes, it was an abundance. It was generous. Giving by the grace of God, giving, enduring, giving during suffering, giving with joy, giving during poverty, giving generously. And number six, giving willfully. Willfully. Look at verse 3. I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. Paul is saying, I didn't ask them. They just gave. No one had to tell them to give. They simply gave. So you give willfully. And seventhly, you give eagerly and insistently. Verse, verse 4. Begging us with much entreaty. For the participation, and that leads us to number eight, you eagerly want to give but because you eagerly want to participate in the ministry. When you give offering, you give because you eagerly want to be part of God's work. And eighthly, or ninthly, you give unto the Lord first. Because look, look at verse 5. And this, not as we expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. These are people who give themselves to God. To them, having a lot of money or having little money, it's no difference. I serve God. Nothing I have is my own. Guys, we have to get used to seeing the possessions that we have at home as this is God's and He can give it to anybody He wants. My car, my jacket, my whatever is the Lord's, it is not mine. I give myself to the Lord first and I will give graciously because I want to participate in ministry. So if you really want to be part of the ministry, it's done through giving. Because giving supports others who has to do the ministry. So now I hope that gives you kind of a perspective. There's more, but I think we should end here. We'll pick it up more next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you have taught us so far. And we want to now learn to give with much abundance and liberality to those in the church that are in need, and especially for the office of the elder. We pray one day that you will bring about the abundance of giving uh, with, the, or with the abundance of people and their abundance of their, of their income, that we would have many pastors supported through this ministry to do the work of God. Father, we realize it's not just giving money. There's so much spiritual dimensions involved in the, in the practice of worship through the giving of offering. Help us to give up this world that nothing is ours. Help us to give ourselves to you that whatever we have is from your hand and it belongs to you and whoever needs it, Lord, you can give it to them through us. We will simply be eager to, be, to participate. Help us, O oh Lord, to love you and not love this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.